my name is Jim, and we're going to be talking about all the different knobs, dials, switches, handles, bolts, things that you can adjust, everything that you can change on a Bridgeport milling machine today on Manjaro. This is the second in a three-part series that I'm making on Bridgeport milling machines. The first one was a video about why you should get a Bridgeport and how useful they are. Today I'm going to go over all the different functions, and then the next video is going to be what to look for if you want to buy a Bridgeport. So this video is not meant to be how to do, use a milling machine, how to mill parts. That is an incredibly vast and broad topic that I'm not really qualified to give. And there's a lot of other people on YouTube who do a much better job at that than me. This is the like most basic introduction of what all the different handles do. It'll give you a little bit of an overview of the versatility of a bridge port, but mostly it's just meant to show you you know, so when you go to look at bridge ports, if you're, you're trying to buy one or you get one and you want to understand exactly what things do, what does this knob do, what does this handle do, that's what we're going to be going over today. So I'm going to start at the top of the bridge port and work my way down just so that it's in some kind of order. If you're trying to figure out what one of the handles does in particular, you can kind of skip through depending on how high up on the machine it is. And I'll say that there is an excellent Bridgeport manual, obviously written by the Bridgeport company. Um, it's available on Keith Rucker's Vintage Machinery website. So if you have a more in-depth question about what one of the handles does, something like that, it's a good, great place to look is there. So before we get started, I wanted to talk about two uh, kind of spots for information on the Bridgeport. Up here is the motor nameplate. This will tell you what size motor it is. This is, it happens to be a one and a half horsepower motor. Almost all bridge ports are going to have a three-phase motor on them, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, over here, it will tell you the serial number of the head. So this portion all right here is called the head of a bridge port, and they were kind of a separate piece to the base of the bridge port. They kind of evolved differently, and you know they were always sold as a unit, but you could get different heads on different bases, and it kind of changed over time as to, as to the configuration of them. So the serial number for the head is right here, and the serial number for the base is over here. So this one in particular was built in 1972. It's a 2J head. That's kind of the most up-to-date head there is now. They, they do have a, a slightly more powerful motor, um, but the most important thing about this head is that it's variable speed. The table is a 9 by 42 inch table. Now they make a 9 by 48 inch table, which a lot of people say is actually too big for the knee on this bridge port. So the 42 is kind of the the sweet spot of the table sizes, it's big enough to give you a good working area, but it's not too big that it's going to be detrimental to the actual working of the bridge port. There are smaller tables available. I've seen ones that are even like this big on a bridge port. I assume that's a custom thing, but they go, you know, they go from that big all the way up to four feet wide. So let's get started at the top here and we'll work our way down. Starting at the top of the machine, we have the motor at the very top, and then right below it, you'll see this little hex here. So the hex is actually the top of the draw bar. So this is a draw bar here. It runs through the head of the machine down to the nose of the spindle and it attaches to your collet. So this is a collet. You're going to need a couple different ones of these for different sizes. And this is what holds your cutter. So it's got a couple little slits in it as well as a little taper at the bottom here. Now that's an R8 taper and it fits to a matching taper inside the bottom of the spindle. When you put your draw bar in and then slide your collet up, you then can tighten it down and it screws on there and will pull it into that taper. So that's how you go about changing your cutters. The best way to do it is with a tool like this. So this has a three quarter inch socket on one end, which matches up with this hex up here, and then a little brass hammer on the other end. So as this gets tightened up in there, it tends to stick a little bit. So after you loosen it just a little, you tap it with the hammer and it'll drop out. You don't want to loosen it completely before you change the bit, because then it'll just be uh, hitting on the very bottom thread, and that'll end up messing up the threads on your draw bar. So you just want to loosen it a little bit so that most of the threads are still engaged. Give it a little tap, it'll loosen, and then you can undo it the rest of the way. I do like to use an impact on that. It makes it a lot faster. Just have a three-quarter inch socket, socket on here. You just put that on there, and you can zip it off real fast. It's not enough to actually tighten it completely, so I still use the wrench to tighten it, and still use the little hammer on there to get it loose. Now to hold the spindle in place while you're tightening it, loosening it, is this handle on the side here. So this handle, that it's a little hard to see, it's behind this, but it's just a little black handle here. When you push it to the side, it locks the spindle in place, and that lets you be able to tighten it real well. <clears throat> so next up is this little handle here. So this handle here adjusts the speed on the 2J variable speed heads. You just spin the handle around, and there's a little dial here that tells you how many RPM you're going. It makes it super easy to change speeds. On some of the slower models, there'll be a little cutout here, and there'll be some belts that you can see behind there, and you can change those belts to change speeds. 
So there's actually a second set of speeds in here. It's got a back drive gear. And to engage that, that's what this lever over here is for. You flip this lever around and that engages the back gear. Now, when you do that, you have to be careful because it reverses the direction of the spindle. So when you turn the machine on, you have to turn it on backwards. Otherwise your cutter's not gonna be working right. Now, both of these things really need to be uh, turned while the machine is on. If you don't, the way this, this is changing the belts inside there, they can tend to bind up and you'll feel it and you won't really be able to turn it. The same with this, this can get locked. You don't wanna do it while it's on, but sometimes you have to kind of manually turn this, the spindle head down here to get it into position. So over here at the top, we have this three position switch. It's got a neutral position or an off position and it's labeled high and low, but it's really a forward and reverse switch. The high is meant to go with the high uh, on the lever I showed before, and the low goes with the back gear on the lever. So it's really just forward and reverse. Now you can see that this switch doesn't do anything for me, and that's because I use a variable frequency drive. So like I mentioned, this is a three phase motor. I'm in a residential area, so I only have single phase. So I use a variable frequency drive, which will take that single phase and spit out with three phase. So with this, I, I've got an external control panel, which is just out of frame here, that I can use to turn the mill on and off. I can also use this little knob here to adjust the speed. Now, because I have a variable speed head, that being able to adjust the speed is not super important. If you do get one that has a pulley system though, it can be very useful to have that variable speed let you change the speed rather than have to change the belts on here. You do lose a bit of torque, particularly as you get to the extremes of it, but it is still very useful for you know, quickly switching speeds back and forth. Now this is the spindle brake that I mentioned before, so you push it to one side or you can push it to the other side. And then if you push it and flip it out, you can lock the spindle in place. I actually try to avoid doing that because undoubtedly I'll lock the spindle in a place, forget that I have it locked, and then try to turn it on and that won't be good. So I usually just leave it off, use one hand to turn it, and then use the other hand on uh, the, the draw bar up here. Now in the back here, there's four bolts, one, two, and then two more on the other side. And if you undo those, then you can swing the whole head. So this head is right now at 90 degrees to my table. But if I undo those four bolts, I can push on this and swing the whole head around. That's useful for two things. First off, you can get the head then off to the side and clear the table. If you want to clamp something to the front of the table, you could do that. It's a very large or tall workpiece. You can clamp it to the front of the table, twist this head over here, stick it out, and get to that workpiece if you need to. So it can be super versatile. The other thing is you may see on the back there, there's a big lug and you can actually mount a second head on a bridge port. So on the back, there's a lug that you can mount a different type of head. So you can put a shaper head, something that cuts up and down on the back. And then if you want to use that, you spin the whole thing around and then you can use that head without having to you know, actually put the head on and off the machine. I'm not going to spin it right around right now because I'd have to take my DRO off and it's a big, bit of a pain, but it's just these four bolts and then it'll swing around. Now there's two other bolts here, this one and this one, and that lets you slide the head in and out. So that lets you get more reach if you want need the head to come out this way, if you gotta get something that doesn't fit into like a smaller area here. Or once again, if you wanna reach it out past the table to work on a big uh, part over on the side. You may notice that I have just a big, big bolt here. Um, that's, I lost the handle or it got broken at some point. So once these two bolts are, are loosened, you can just pull on that, that's supposed to be a handle and it moves the head in and out. <clears throat> Pretty simple and straightforward there. And then you gotta make sure you tighten these again while you're uh, gonna use using the machine. Now the next thing on the side here, you saw me remove it. This is the quill handle. So I've heard this called a speed handle. This is not an original Bridgeport part, but it locks in, there's a little pin there, and then you can move the head up and down, up and down like that. And then if you want, you can either just pull it off flip it around and then move it around that way. That way that you're always kind of pushing it in a comfortable position. If you're say drilling a hole or just moving it up and down, it you know it can be kind of awkward to reach around back that way. So you can flip it around to a different position if you want. Now getting it down to the bottom here, this is the quill lock. So this, when it's up, you can move the quill up and down very easily. When it's down, that's locked into place. So you can't really move it. Now that's good if you're going to be milling a slot, you want it locked in a certain position. And if you put it down just a little bit, then there's a little bit of tension on there that can be useful too. And all the way up if you want to be drilling or something like that. So all this stuff here is to feed the quill up and down. 
as I was saying before, this is the handle that just generally moves it, and that's what you're going to be using most of the time. However, there are normally two other options for feeding the quill down. The second is a big wheel that's right here, and you can see it's missing from my, will, my mill. It was taken off to make room for a digital readout, which is super handy to have. That's this scale right here and a little reader here. As the quill goes up and down, that reader reads the position on the scale and displays it on the readout over here. And that lets you make very precise uh, depth holes or new step downs, whatever you want to do. You can precisely put it exactly where you want, lock the quill, and then it's very convenient to be able to measure everything. I have that on all three axes. It's a very handy feature to have, but it does mean that they had to take that wheel off. So that wheel is used for more precise control going up and down, but it's not something that you really need. This uh, digital readout also kind of blocks the scale here which can be a little irritating, but since I have the digital readout, I basically never need to use this anyway. Now, the next thing that's over here is the power down feed system. So this is a system if you have a lot of holes to drill or you want to use a boring bar and very consistently move the head down more consistently than you can do by hand, you can engage this power feed system and that will consistently move it down, give you a nice surface finish, make it a lot easier so you don't have to keep moving the handle down, makes life really, really nice. To turn that on, you flip this over to the engage position, and that engages the whole system. It doesn't actually start feeding it. There's a lot of gears and stuff, and if you had that on all the time, they would wear out prematurely. So you want to turn that off when you're not using it, and then turning it on when you are using it. Once that's on, you flip that lever out, and that engages the power down feed system, and it starts moving down. How fast it moves down is controlled by this little knob over here. There's three settings, one and a half, three, and six thousandths per RPM, and that tells it just how fast to go. As it's moving down, when it gets all the way to the bottom, either hitting the bottom stop here, or you can move this dial up, or you can use a little clip on and clip it on here. When it gets down to that spot, it will automatically kick out of uh, gear, and then you can move the handle up and go on to your next hole. So it makes drilling a whole lot of holes very convenient and very easy. I'm going to turn the mill on now and I'll show you just how to do that. It's pretty loud, so I'm just going to let it run and I'll show you exactly how that works. So the mill's on now and you can see that this is spinning and that means that the system's engaged. So if I flip this out, it'll start moving down. I've got it set right now to the fastest speed just to show you. When it hits that stop, it kicks out and then you can pull it back up and go into your next hole. Looking at the bottom of the mill here, we have the main controls for the table to move it around. So this is the y-axis control, so turning this moves the table in and out. Tucked back around here is the lock for this axis, so there's a little handle just like this one. Over on the side here, you flip that around and that'll lock the table so that if you're not moving it in that direction, it keeps it nice and rigid. You can see on here, there's a little scale here, and that will tell you exactly how far you've moved the, the axis. Now on mine, you can see that this is kind of dirty and dingy here, and that's because I don't really ever use it. I usually just use the DRO, which is a little more precise, a little easier to see, and a little easier to use. Now the same thing exists over here on the x-axis. There's a handle over here and a dial, and then there's a matching one on the other end of the table. So if you're down here, you can use that one. If you're over here, you can use this one. And you can also notice over here, I have a power feed on my x-axis here. So the power feed works with this little handle. I flip it over and it moves the axis automatically. The power feed has an adjustment, adjustable speed. So if I'm going over, I can make it go faster or really slowly, depending on what I'm doing. And I can also override that and have a rapid if I push this button here. That'll shoot across the table very quickly to move it in and out to get into position. So if the power feed isn't working, there's two things. There's a hidden switch on the bottom down here to turn it on and off. And then there's also limits on it. So in the back here, there's a switch in the center and then there's these two adjustable blocks here and a rod that you can tighten those down to. And if those blocks hit the switch in the center, it stops the power feed from working so that it doesn't overshoot the travels. You can also adjust it so that if you're making a consistent cut from you know, one spot to the other, it'll automatically shut itself off and you don't have to worry about overshooting it. So the last control over here is the knee control. So this controls the height of the knee and you can crank this up and down. And it also has a scale on it so you can move it very precisely if you want. Now one little cheat that you can do now is if you have a 3D printer or know someone who has one, you can print out a little adapter for your cordless drill and that will go in here 
and lock into the teeth just like that. And then you have a power feed for your up and down. So it makes it very easy. Obviously you can see you don't want to go too fast with it. It doesn't like it if you go too fast, but it makes it super easy if you need to change vices out or change a drill truck that has a lot more length and you want to move it up and down very quickly. So we're getting to the oily undergarments of the machine here now. And this is the one shot lubrication system that my mill has. The original machines didn't have this and you had to lubricate all the ways individually. But on most of the modern machines, they all have a one shot lubrication system. So what that means is that when you pull this handle, it, there's a little piston that pumps oil through all these little hoses here to all the different ways. Now, assuming they're all clear and these hoses aren't blocked or cracked, that should pump oil onto all your ways and keep everything nice and lubricated. You can see it slowly pushes down. There's a spring in there and that slowly pumps all the oil through. Now it says that you should do this every four hours of operation. What I typically do is whenever I move the knee up and down, I'll just grab this while I'm down here and hit a, you know, push it down once to pump some oil everywhere. And that seems like it's a good amount of oil for how much I use the mill. Obviously, if I'm just sitting there moving it around and never raise it, I want to probably do that a little bit more. That's all the various controls on a Bridgeport milling machine. I think I got them all. If I missed one, let me know in the comments below. Now, depending on the vintage of a Bridgeport or if it's not actually an official Bridgeport, if it's some other brand of vertical milling machine, the controls are going to be slightly different, but they're all kind of be generally the same. You should be able to figure out what's going on pretty easily with that. Now, if you're interested in buying your own Bridgeport or want to know why you should buy your own Bridgeport, the first video I did in this series is why you want one, and then the next video that I'm going to do next week is what to look for if you're in the market for one and you're looking at a whole bunch of used Bridgeports and trying to figure out what condition they're in, what kind of accessories you want with them, and that sort of thing. If you like this video, give it a, give it a thumbs up, and thanks for watching.